exactly. Huh? <laughs> okay, so we'll just give it a minute for folks to file in. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like there's still people joining the space, but I'm going to go ahead and start with announcements. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Rachel Hassan. I'm with UNM's Division for Community Behavioral Health. Thank you and welcome um, to our Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. A couple of announcements regarding our CEU process. Uh, in order to qualify for the CEUs, you need to be on the lecture for the full hour. In the last five minutes of the lecture, we will uh, put the evaluation link in the chat. If you uh, toggle the menu with your um, or your screen with your mouse, you'll see at the bottom there's a green button or not a green button. There's a chat button. Uh, you'll click that and that'll open your chat box. The link will be in there. Copy and paste it or click on it um, and fill out the evaluation. When you're finished with the evaluation, a certificate of completion will be automatically generated for you. Uh, it's your responsibility to save it. So if you're on your smartphone, you'll want to take a screenshot of the document. If you're on your computer, you save it as a Word or a PDF. If you're joining us by phone, you can email me and I'm, I will be happy to email you the link to the CEU. Um, we are recording, so we should have a recording link for folks um, after following the, the lecture. Um, and I don't think I asked you, Brianne, are you... Um, are, do we have permission to share your slides with folks too? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so, and a lot of people have emailed me regarding last week. Um, Dick Rogers still has not given me permission about sharing his slides. So uh, we are able to share the, the Zoom link and I'll send that out to everybody, the recording. But uh, as it stands now, we still don't have permission to share his slides. Um, and so if you have any questions, you can submit them in the chat or the Q&A or not the chat. I think the chat is disabled for attendees. So in the Q&A, if you have any questions, submit them there and I'll hand it over to Simone. Hi everyone. So welcome to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. So this series is hosted by UNM Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. So we're so glad that you all joined us today. My name is Simone Fulion. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, I just want to put a plug out there for next week's presentation. We hope that you join us for Michael Vitico, who will be presenting forensic evaluations in the age of social media. So it should be pretty interesting. Next, just a little housekeeping on how things are going to go today. So for this talk, please ask the questions in the Q&A at any time that you want, but just know that we're going to be answering them at the end of the presentation, okay? Also, you know, we have a lot of people that attend these. We do our very best to get to all of the questions if we can, but if we don't get to yours, we apologize in advance because we only have so much time to be able to do that, okay? Um, Again, Rachel already explained the CEU process, but if you're on a tight schedule, just make sure you log out at the hour. Um, you do have to attend the full hour, but um, Brie has graciously offered to stay, I think for a couple of minutes afterwards to ask, answer questions. So if you are able to hang out for questions, then yeah, please do so. Okay, so now what we all are here for today is to hear about uh, suicide risk from my good friend, Bree. So I'm really excited. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, being volunteered to do this for us. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's nice to see you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna give a little bit of a bio for you. Uh, so Dr. Brianne Layden completed her PhD in clinical forensic psychology at Simon Fraser University, clinical internship at the University of Massachusetts Medical School Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital, and a forensic psychology fellowship at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She currently works as a threat assessment specialist at Protect International Risk and Safety Services, and is the associate editor of Intelligence, an e-newsletter that keeps professionals up to date about recent advances in threat assessment around the globe. Her expertise involves the assessment and management of self-directed violence and personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder, and the intersection of risk um, with those issues. 
So she's provided trainings and workshops, invited presentations for forensic mental health, law enforcement, corrections, security, victim services, higher education, and has co-authored over 50 articles and conference presentations. She's currently in the process of developing a struck professional judgment guideline for the assessment and management of self-directed violence, which is what she is going to be presenting with us today for. She's also a really wonderful human and has a really great story about her and her brother and a bear that I'm not gonna share today, but it stays <laughs> Who let her do the introduction? Okay. I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't share the story. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much again, Brie. Appreciate you being here. I'm going to go dark. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you very much for Simone, uh, Simone for the lovely introduction uh, and uh, sharing my personal story. If that comes up in the Q&A, I will not answer that <laughs> at the end. Um, I just wanted to thank the University of New Mexico for putting on this series. It's, I know a lot of hard work in, in putting this together every week, and this has been really nice, I know, for myself and my colleagues to have available to us during the pandemic, especially um, when opportunities for continuing education and professional development are limited. So thank you very much for putting in all of that hard work behind the scenes, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to present uh, on self-directed violence with you guys today. Um, so we've already gone through the bio, so I don't need to do that, plus some additional personal information. Um, but I just want to state that I have no financial relationship to the program, and also the views that are expressed in this presentation are that of um, my own and do not necessarily represent the views, policies, um, and positions of the University of New Mexico. In terms of learning objectives, uh, it's my hope today that I'm really just gonna give people a lay of the land on what's happening in the field of self-directed violence, risk assessment and management. So I'm gonna start with our professional responsibilities in this area. Um, that's gonna be the first bit that we'll talk about. And then next we're gonna move into looking at different procedures that are being used across different sectors. Uh, so comparing and con contrasting across different sectors. And then I'm going to end, as Simone said, with a discussion of comprehensive assessment and management of risk for self-directed violence, focusing on the structured professional judgment model um, in this area. So I really just want to give people an overview of what's available and what's out there, what's being used, and whether or not um, some of the tools that you might be using are fulfilling these professional responsibilities that we have for self-directed violence. Okay, I want to start with this uh, first slide from the World Health Organization. This was from their World Report on Violence and Health in 2002. And I think this is a really important um, point that they made is that they've defined violence as including or encompassing three broad forms or types. The first one being self-directed, so any violence directed towards the self. Uh, the second one being interpersonal, so general violence. And the third being collective, violence that's engaged into further some goals or objectives of a group. So this could be things like um, you know, group-based violence, like terrorism or gang-related violence. Um, I think this is a really important point because some of the problems that we see uh, today in terms of assessing and managing risk for self-directed violence are that we see this as being very different from violence towards other people. So we see people using unstructured clinical judgments. We also see people um, doing quick 10 to 15 minute question and answer periods, asking the person, you know, do you want to kill yourself? And then making a decision about management on the basis of very limited information. I think that um, the field would do a lot uh, by borrowing from the other areas. So by looking at some of the advances, some of the arguments or debates that have happened in fields of general violence or group-based violence, and using that same kind of advancements to apply to self-directed violence, I think we would do a lot better. Um, we've long known that doing comprehensive assessments for violence risk aren't, is necessary, but across different sectors, we don't seem to think the same thing around self-directed violence risk. So we still see these really short, evaluations that people are doing. So I guess my, my goal with this presentation and starting off with this slide is to get people to think about this more like we think about violence towards others, just like the World Health Organization has defined it in this way. And I think the more that as professionals, we start to um, approach this risk in that way, the better that we're going to do in terms of fulfilling our professional responsibilities. And when I talk about those responsibilities, it's a bit of a changing landscape to paint, depending on the sector that you're working in. So I wanna highlight some of those issues in the presentation today. 
So in terms of the definition of self-directed violence, um, it's impossible for us to come up with an exhaustive list of all of the things that count as self-directed violence. We can't um, possibly put together this list. We're always gonna have those cases that we come across that are like ends of one, where something comes up that we haven't seen before and we're left scratching our head saying, does this count as self-directed violence or is this something else? Um, so broadly, we need a, a definition that's flexible, that it can change with a changing social or societal landscape, and it also allows us to consider new behaviors um, and ask ourselves, is this something that I think counts? Should I be treating this in the same way as I would treat other forms of self-directed violence? So broadly, the definition is that any conduct that causes actual, potential, or reasonable fear of physical self-injury that is intentional and unauthorized. So the first thing that we need to do is to look at the behavior. What is it that the person's actually done? When we're trying to figure out if something counts as self-directed violence or meets the definition, we have to ask ourselves, what did the person do? Was it cutting, burning, scratching? Was it asphyxiation, overdosing? Was it restricting eating to the point that it causes tissue damage? Um, very often when we do training on self-directed violence, we have people that ask us, does substance use count? Does overdosing count? Or does um, eating disorder behavior that causes tissue damage, like anorexia nervosa, does that count as self-directed violence? And the answer is just like, you know, the answer to many questions in psychology is that it depends. Um, and one of the things that it depends on is what's going on in the person's head at the time. What were they thinking when they engaged in that behavior? And when we think about intent in this definition, it includes everything that um, starts with, you know, no suicidal intent or no lethal intent, sometimes called non-suicidal self-injury, all the way up to behaviors that include uh, clear lethal intent or where the person was clearly wanting to die when they engaged in the behavior. And you'll find ambiguous or vague intent somewhere in the middle. So it's important for us to ask ourselves not just what did the person do, but what were they thinking at the time that they engage in this behavior. The reason why um, in this definition we encompass both non-suicidal self-injury and suicidal behavior is that, you know, it's great for us in terms of research. I've done research in this area and I often separate out non-suicidal and suicidal self-injury, especially when we're trying to think about risk factors that are unique or overlapping in both of those risks. So it's useful in terms of research. Clinically, though, and in practice, when we think about our legal and professional responsibilities, it's um, safer for us to include these behaviors as being on a continuum or a spectrum. Anytime that we're working with someone or evaluating someone that wants to harm themselves or somebody else, this triggers some responsibilities on our behalf. So treating this on a continuum, much like we would treat um, other directed violence, so assault all the way up to, say, homicide, for example, we do the same thing with self-directed violence so that it triggers the same response and we're not saying that anything that's non-suicidal self-injury isn't also important or warranting a response from us. Um, if you've worked in this area with patients uh, doing treatment, for example, with people that engage in non-suicidal self-injury, we do see that um, you'll have some patients that will engage in non-suicidal self-injury for years and then all of a sudden have something that where they cut too deep or they took too much of a particular substance. So there's always that risk that it could um, turn into a lethal or a harmful, a very harmful event. So in this definition, we um, encompass both non-lethal and lethal intent. Also, if you've worked in this area, what you probably are thinking about right now is that oftentimes we don't know what the person's thinking at the time. Um, and if we do ask them what they're thinking at the time they engage in a behavior, we get responses like, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was intending. I'm not sure if I wanted to die or I didn't want to die at that time. Um, so we see a lot of that kind of vague or ambiguous intent. Then that's many of the cases or most of the cases that we actually work on, people will, will give you that response. So it's not enough for us to only consider the behavior and the intent at the time. We also have to think about the consequences. What were the uh, actual consequences or possible consequences of engaging in this um, behavior? This can be really helpful when you're trying to think about the difference between non-suicidal self-injury and suicidal self-directed violence is to think about could the behavior reasonably have caused lethal harm? Should the person reasonably ought to have known that this action or this behavior could be lethal? Were they so reckless in their engagement in the behavior that they didn't care about the outcome? And if so, you might be thinking that this behavior lies more on that suicidal end of the spectrum or more lethal end of the spectrum rather than non-lethal. Um, so it can be helpful to think about what were the actual consequences. 
This can also be helpful when we have some behaviors that people engage in that are risky, but it's not, we don't think it should meet this definition of self-directed violence. So I often get the question in training is do um, base jumpers where you're jumping off of different structures like buildings or cliffs, for example, does that count as self-directed violence? It could, it has the potential to cause physical self-injury. So it's important for us to think about the consequence, the intended consequence of the behavior. Is the person engaging in the behavior because it causes physical self-injury? Or are they engaging in the behavior despite the fact that it might cause physical self-injury? Um, typically base jumpers, I have a friend who is one, God knows why <laughs> they do this, but they get some enjoyment from it. Um, they're not doing it because they're wanting to hurt themselves. They're engaging in the behavior for other reasons, in spite of the fact that it, caught, it has this potential risk of causing injury. So thinking about the intended consequence of the behavior can also be helpful when you're trying to determine, does this count as self-directed violence? The last part of this definition that I'm gonna emphasize is the unauthorized piece in the text on the top. Uh, this is important for us to build into the definition that we have for self-directed violence because the landscape or the, the legal land or social landscape around self-directed violence changes. So we don't want to include behaviors that are socially sanctioned or authorized. So very recently in Canada, we legalized physician assisted suicide. So this behavior is authorized, it's legal. We wouldn't want to count this as meeting the definition of self-directed violence in the same way as unauthorized or not socially sanctioned suicide attempts, for example. Also, there's some cultures who engage in um, self-directed violence or self-injury, like self-scarification, but it's not to cause physical self-injury. It's a means of identifying themselves when they're moving between different groups or, or tribes, for example, so that when they move around the land or the area that they work in, that they're able to be identified by other groups as belonging to this specific or particular tribe or group. Um, so it's not, it wouldn't meet the definition because it's socially sanctioned, it's authorized in that way, it's culturally appropriate. Um, so we also want to make sure our definitions for self-directed violence take into account diversity related issues. So we're not including things that we shouldn't that are, are culturally appropriate. So our definition should be flexible, it should be broad, and it should weed out the behaviors that we think are um, diversity related issues or socially sanctioned behaviors. Okay, so now that we've gone over the uh, definition of self-directed violence, I'm just going to briefly touch on um, how big of a problem this is across sectors, just to give us a bit of a foundation to understand that this isn't something that's just occurring in, you know, correctional centers or healthcare, for example. So when we look at traditional sectors like hospitals or correctional facilities, we see in hospitals rates of about 3.2 per 100,000, somewhere between 48 and 64 hospital suicides, so occurring in a hospital setting per year in the US. Um, when we look at closed facilities like prisons or correctional centers, we see a much higher rate, so 23 per 100,000. Um, this is um, expected in some ways when we have closed facilities uh, like prisons we see, or jails, we see a lot more elevated rates of lethal self-directed violence. Uh, sometimes when you restrict the means that people can use to engage in self-directed violence, they use um, things that they might not use in the community that could potentially be more lethal, more asphyxiation, for example. Um, so we see rates between 3.2 and 23 per 100,000 in traditional sectors. And when we look at non-traditional sectors like workplaces or institutes of higher education, we see much lower rates of suicide in workplaces. So 1.5 per million individuals between 2003 and 2010. When we look at higher education, we see again a higher rate somewhere between hospitals and closed facilities, around 6.17 per 100,000. And I think um, numbers aside, the important part here is to look uh, kind of at you know, where suicides are occurring in different sectors. This is something that we're seeing happen in the workplace. This isn't something that's just happening from an employee doing it in their home, for example. We see that this is happening at work sites as well. So this is something that if you're consulting or working with large organizations, you should be thinking about their professional responsibilities around responding to and managing self-directed violence in the workplace. I'm um, in higher education, we see elevated rates, we see elevated rates of risky behaviors generally in higher education settings. So higher rates of substance use, disordered eating, we see higher rates of um, people engaging in violence towards others. So it's no surprise that we're seeing also elevated rates of um, suicidal self-directed violence in this setting as well. So we see this happening across sectors, healthcare, correctional or criminal justice sectors, 
uh, higher education and workplaces. So what are our responsibilities? We're actually required by statutory law, common law and professional codes of ethics to identify and respond to obvious warning signs for self-directed violence. And I'm emphasizing the word obvious here because we're going to see as we go throughout some of the case law that um, really what the courts are requiring us to do is to respond to what are very clear signs that anybody should be able to pick up on that indicate elevated risk for self-directed violence. If we don't respond to these obvious warning signs, this is where we find ourselves um, in trouble in terms of legal liability if our actions aren't meeting professional standards of care. So across each of these different sectors, we have responsibilities with regard to self-directed violence. Where we see it less clear, and we'll talk about this in a moment, is workplaces. Um, so we'll go over some examples of statutory law, common law, and codes of ethics, just to really clarify what our responsibilities are. So this is the Code of Ethics for Psychologists in Canada. Um, we're required to do, this is gonna be familiar to many people that are on the call, um, to do everything reasonably possible to stop or offset the consequences of actions by others when they're likely to cause imminent or serious harm to themselves or somebody else. Um, so that also specifies that we're able to breach confidentiality and report to people if we think that they can do something to intervene to reduce the risk, like police or family, for example, if we think they can um, mitigate or prevent that outcome from happening. So the threshold for um, disclosure in this case is actually quite high. It has to be imminent, serious self-directed violence. We have to be concerned that it could be a serious um, attempt that the person's engaging in. But it's very clear that we are required to do something in terms of both noticing that the risk is occurring, but also responding as healthcare professionals. So our, our requirements are a little bit higher than we're going to see in some of the other sectors. Uh, in terms of the case law that established for psychologists and for healthcare providers, like clinicians, for example, in both Canada and the US, so Haynes versus Bellissimo is um, from Canada and Bella versus Greenson is from the United States. Uh, these cases establish that there's a special relationship between mental health professionals that triggers this duty of care. Um, so we must take reasonable steps to offset um, self-directed violence if we think that the risk exists and is um, likely. So it established this existence of a special relationship between a provider and their clients that triggers a, a duty to respond. Um, so this is for um, people working in um, healthcare settings, for example, or healthcare providers or clinicians or psychologists, for example. And then when we look at closed facilities to see what our professional responsibilities are, the first case is um, from where I'm located in British Columbia. This is Funk Estate uh, versus CLAP. This is a, a um, individual who attempted suicide in a uh, jail setting. It was in a holding cell. Um, in this case, when it well, went to court afterwards, the judge decided that jailers have a special relationship, much like we see with healthcare providers when they're housing or detaining someone that triggers a duty to care to protect the person when we see foreseeable risk of self-directed violence. When we look to the states, though, the threshold's a little bit different. So Estelle versus Gamble and um, Farmer versus uh, Brennan in 1976, and then clarified again in 1994, uh, states that institutions may be held liable if they show conscious, reckless indifference to the health and safety of inmates. So this could be reckless indifference to the identification of warning signs, so not asking about self-directed violence if you think that the person could be at risk, or if you know that they're at risk, reckless indifference in terms of responding to the person. Um, the threshold's actually higher in the U.S., so it's harder for families and other people to successfully sue an institution, uh, when an inmate's engaged in uh, lethal self-directed violence. The, it's easier for people to do that successfully in Canada with the special relationship um, clause than it is in the United States. But it's still clarified that there is this responsibility for people to react if they think that um, there's foreseeable risk of self-directed violence. We have to ask about it and we also have to respond if we think that the risk exists. And then when we look at uh, the non-traditional sectors like higher education settings, this is where I think it gets really interesting. I think we're all fairly familiar with our responsibilities as psychologists or uh, physicians and we're, we're clear about our responsibilities in working in a healthcare setting or working in a correctional setting. Where I think this gets less clear is when you move into the community and you're working in places like higher education or for large organizations, for example. So in 2018, uh, this was a Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts case. It was Nguyen versus MIT. Um, this was a student who was a graduate student who um, killed himself after getting a, a 
an email that was upsetting from his supervisor. And the family sued MIT or attempted to sue MIT. And in this case, the judge did not uh, find MIT to be specifically liable, but the judge discussed under what conditions they would find an institution liable. So when they looked at MIT, they stated that, you know, there's, um, if the risk is foreseeable that they would, and we'll talk a little bit about what specific aspects of foreseeability are important um, in this case, but that they do have this special relationship with their students where they're required to respond if the risk exists and is foreseeable in terms of self-directed violence. So they're required to do something and respond to these obvious warning signs. Uh, what I think is really interesting is at the same time that this case was happening, you might have seen um, our write-up for the APA uh, newsletter with myself and Christopher King. Um, this has actually been discussed in a number of different uh, places now, these two cases, but there was one in California, Re Regents versus the University of California. In 2018, it was um, a student who engaged in violence towards another student. He would stabbed a female student in his class. She lived and she sued the university. And the judge similarly ruled that the higher education institutions have this special responsibility. So both with violence and self-directed violence, we're now seeing that the courts are treating it similarly in terms of um, exist an existing special relationship between the institution and the students, similar to what we see at least in Canada in terms of a closed facility like a prison setting and the inmates that they house. Usually when you're housing people, your responsibility in terms of duty of care and keeping them safe raises, but we're now seeing courts holding um, higher institutions to similar thresholds in terms of having this relationship and a duty of care that exists. When we look to workplaces, I'm just gonna give an example from British Columbia for, from our occupational health and safety regulations where I'm located. Um, it becomes a lot less clear what people's professional responsibilities are to um, respond or to identify warning signs for self-directed violence. So if you look at our regulations in British Columbia and you search for the word suicide, it will not come up anywhere. It's nowhere stated in our reg uh, regulations that people are required to do anything in response to suicide. And this used to be true for a violence risk if you looked 20, 25 years ago as well. You wouldn't have seen any specific um, requirements around violence risk in the workplace and what employers are required to do to keep employees safe. But it was always encompassed under this general duty provision. So even in provinces in Canada right now that don't have specific um, requirements around violence, the employer is still required to take steps to keep their employees safe from this risk under the general duty provision where they're just required more generally to maintain a safe workplace that um, doesn't expose workers to undue risk of occupational disease um, to any person. So I contacted um, the representative from the Occupational Health and Safety Office in British Columbia to ask them what their thoughts were around self-directed violence and professional responsibilities. And they said that they're actually currently doing assessments in workplaces. So if a workplace is concerned about a particular employee that they may pose a risk for engaging in self-directed violence at the workplace, they can phone and get some support and they can connect them with resources. So they're starting to do these evaluations and he believed that it would be counted under this general duty provision that if it's obvious and it's foreseeable and you think that it could expose other employees, for example, to this person's behavior, so causing psychological harm to other employees, that this would be something the employer is required to take steps to prevent. Um, so it was his opinion that in the next revision of our occupational health and safety regulations, you might see a little bit more clarity around what employers are required to do uh, to respond to self-directed violence. So they started to put some best practice guidelines and some tips and strategies around what they do on their website as well. So it's a bit of a changing landscape here. Um, we tell people when we're consulting with them that it's probably best to assume that you do have some responsibilities or duties in this area and to take steps to prevent it. Um, even in Canada, where we haven't had the same uh, cases come up in higher education institutions, we often look to the US when courts are deciding on a new case that we haven't seen specifically in Canada. So when the Tarasov case came out around responsibilities in terms of violence uh, risk posed towards other people, we had the Smith versus Jones case in Canada that relied heavily on the Tarasov case. So we would expect something similar to happen around self-directed violence in higher education. And we would expect something very similar in terms of our responsibilities in workplaces now that we see this changing uh, landscape so that they're actually doing these assessments. The other thing that tells us that um, we, you know, our responsibility should be increasing somewhat in this area, we should be paying more attention to suicide in the workplace 
is that in Canada, um, this was in 2013, the national standards were published. And this is a, a, a guidebook or a reference manual that you can use to try and improve the psychological health and safety of people in your workplace. And it provides a lot of resources and guidelines on different areas that you can improve upon and self tests or self assessments that you can do to see how your workplace is doing. And they specifically mentioned suicide in this um, workbook of this reference manual dating back to 2013. So stating that organizations should have procedures in place for reporting and investigating any workplace psychological health and safety incidents, including things like suicide. Um, so we can't really state that if we're, you know, consulting with an organization where a suicide happens, they can't really state that they didn't know that they might have had professional responsibilities in this area, given the recommendations and the publications that are coming out around best practices for prevention and management um, in workplaces. So just encourage people to pay attention to this area a little bit more. We're likely to see this change a little bit um, as the years go on. Okay, so what are the implications of this? At minimum, regardless of the sector that you're working in, professionals or providers in each of these sectors are required to identify obvious signs of self-directed violence risk. Beyond the identification of obvious warning signs, your responsibilities are gonna vary depending on your specific profession. So if you're in a higher education institution, for example, or you consult with them, your responsibilities as say a psychologist in terms of managing risk is gonna be higher than what they would expect for a staff or faculty member. Um, but regardless, when we looked at that New Yen versus MIT case, the um, judge said that anybody should be able to identify the most obvious of warning signs. So that um, burden is kind of imposed on everybody working in that specific sector. Um, so just pay attention to your professional responsibilities and the sectors that you work in, in terms of what exactly it is that you're required to do. Um, but if you're a psychologist or physician, for example, or a clinician working in those settings, you're likely going to have a little bit of a higher um, burden as well. Okay, in terms of what's available for identifying risk, so I keep saying that our responsibilities uh, surround the identification of risk. Um, so if we look at all of the tools that are available out there, they can broadly be classified into these three categories. Um, when we think about identification, this is not comprehensive assessment. This is picking up on risk if risk exists. Uh, the first method here is tracking, and this is um, just to put it simply, it's like repeated assessment or monitoring. So it's uh, monitoring someone over time to see whether or not any warning signs for self-directed violence come up. And if they do, tracking them on like an Excel sheet, for example, and reporting it to the people who are responsible for managing the case. So if you're in like a psychiatric closed setting, you might be working with the patients as a frontline or a support worker. And then if you notice any of these warning signs, you're noting them down and providing the information to the treatment team, for example. So it's reactive or passive in nature. Now, this is a really good method to use once somebody's been um, has engaged in an incident of self-directed violence and you're monitoring them over time to see whether risk is fluctuating. This can be a good method to put in place to identify some of those early warning signs in terms of risk for self-directed violence. Uh, the last two tools I would say are probably the most popular across the four sectors in terms of what people are doing. Many people are screening um, and then a few sectors are actually starting to do triage. So we're seeing this a little bit more, um, but screening is probably still the most popular method that people are using. And screening is inherently diagnostic or predictive in nature. And I think it's important for us to think about what is our tool, what's, what is it actually doing, what's the purpose of it, and is it meeting my goals? So screening is, as I said, inherently diagnostic or predictive. So it's meant to identify caseness, whether or not someone, for example, is of a particular case, like are they at risk for suicide compared to some non at risk population. So to be able to pick up on differences in terms of risk or to predict whether or not somebody's going to engage in self-directed violence. So they're statistical in nature in terms of their development. Um, and they're very concerned with sensitivity and specificity. And oftentimes when we think of screening and you look in healthcare settings, like um, screening for mammograms for breast cancer, for example, it's meant to identify people who need treatment, um, who need a specific intervention in order to decrease the, um, the risk that was identified. So that's usually what screening methods are used for broadly. And triage is used in healthcare settings as well, but the purpose of it is a little bit more functional rather than um, statistical or predictive in nature. 
So triage, the purpose of it is to identify any warning signs or primary warning signs for self-directed violence. So usually acts, threats, or thoughts of self-directed violence. And then if you have multiple cases, or if you're working in an area in which you're dealing with multiple different individuals that are on your desk in terms of assessment, you identify the warning signs that helps you prioritize your cases and then to implement immediate actions. Um, so the difference between uh, screening and triage is triage is not necessarily concerned with prediction per se, it's more concerned with prevention. So identifying a warning sign and then taking steps to mitigate that risk. And the outcome of triage is a little bit different from screening in that treatment might be one of the recommendations you make, but you could be making recommendations for immediate actions like consulting with other providers, contacting police, uh, informal or formal supports, ongoing assessment, like referring the person for a comprehensive assessment of risk for suicide, for example, um, or a particular treatment. So there could be a variety of different outcomes and the outcomes are tailored to the specific sector that you work in and the resources that are available at that particular site, for example. So it's um, highly tailored to where it is that you're working and what resources you have available. I think the uh, really interesting thing is many people, when they think about picking a tool, as I said, probably the most popular tools out there right now are um, screening tools that people use for self-directed violence. And the purpose of screening, as I said, is either diagnostic or predictive in nature. It's to um, determine people who are going to engage in a particular outcome. And when we think about our professional responsibilities that we discussed, prediction isn't one of our professional responsibilities. It wasn't coming up in the case law in terms of us being able to identify who's going to engage in self-directed violence. And I think Bruce Bonger and um, Ed Sullivan put this really nicely in their book. It's a fantastic book. Um, it's their, I think, third edition now in 2013. It's called The Suicidal Patient, Clinical and Legal Standards of Care. And they state in this book that foreseeability is the key issue, but not in the sense of the daunting and perhaps impossible task of predicting the future suicidal behavior of an individual patient. It is failure to predict that the patient was suicidal, not failure to predict that the patient would die by suicide that exposes clinicians to malpractice liability. I think that's very important for us to pay attention to, especially when we're thinking about is my tool I'm appropriate for the purpose that I'm using it for? Is it helping me meet my professional responsibilities and accomplish the goals that I want it to accomplish? We don't necessarily need to be concerned with prediction, but we need to be concerned with identification of risk. That's really what, um, if we're failing to do that and we're failing to respond to warning signs where we find ourselves in trouble in terms of liability. Even when we look back at that new yen case, um, the obvious warning signs that the judge was talking about was that if the institution was aware of a student's suicide attempt while they were enrolled or recently before enrolling at the university, or they were aware of the student's intent or plan to commit suicide, that those warning signs would be so obvious that the person might be at risk for suicide that they should be required to respond. They should take some steps um, to keep the person safe. So the duty of care rested on the notion of foreseeability um, in terms of those obvious warning signs. And again, the, the judge specifically stated that this is not just clinicians who can identify these warning signs. This is faculty, staff, people working at the institution who should be able to recognize that once seeing this, the person might be at risk for self-directed violence. So again, we're seeing in the case law in non-traditional sectors, only that responsibility or that burden to identify the risk and refer the person. The judge said that some appropriate responses to this might be initiating some suicide prevention protocols if that existed at the institution, connecting the person with the appropriate resources to treat them or to mitigate the risk or contacting police or emergency services, for example. So they said that there was a variety of different responses that you could take, but the burden really rested on was the risk foreseeable, was it obvious? Not that they had to predict that Nguyen would have killed himself, but that they failed to identify um, if those uh, cases, if the warning signs were there. And I should say that in the new Yen case, they were neither aware of his um, history in terms of attempts, like anything recent, nor did he specifically state to anybody in the institution that he was thinking about killing himself. So this is why MIT was not held specifically liable. But again, the judge dictated or discussed what would have been um, if a, an institution did miss these things that they could be held liable. Okay, so just a sample of current practices in terms of what people are using to identify risk. So I think the uh, most popular out there right now is probably the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. This was developed in 2011 by Posner and colleagues. 
Uh, since then, they've developed a whole host of different um, tools. So there's screening tools, there's triage tools, and there's tools for comprehensive assessment of risk for self-directed violence. Um, so this is, we see coming up in the more traditional sectors more often. So in many healthcare settings in Canada and the US, this is the primary tool. And then in uh, criminal justice settings, we're moving, at least in British Columbia, away from using things like the sad persons to using the Columbia suicide severity rating scale for risk identification. Um, this, the sad persons is a mnemonic. It was designed to help people um, or evaluators identify the known warning signs or risk factors for self-directed violence. So it was a um, mnemonic of different risk factors. So whether or not the, what the sex the person was, the age, whether they had depression, what kind of supports they had, and depending on the response. So for example, if they were a male, older age and depressed, they would get three points. Um, and then the points structure would dictate whether or not the person was high, moderate or low, depending on the number of points that they had. And having used this in forensic settings for a number of years, I can say that the challenge with this is that um, oftentimes you could go through and you could get, you know, three points for one case and three points for another case and you could feel very differently about the risk that each person posed just because of what was included in this mnemonic and it didn't allow you to consider any other case specific risk factors. And it also didn't help you um, think about treatment or recommendations in terms of what do we do now, now that I know that the person is male of an older age and depressed, am I just going to, you know, recommend treatment for depression. So some of the risk factors, again, were static and didn't lend themselves very well to um, considerations in terms of treatment. And then uh, what's being piloted right now in some healthcare settings is a self-directed violence risk triage. And it's exactly the same format that I was just talking about in terms of um, identifying those primary warning signs, prioritizing cases, and then implementing immediate actions. Um, so this is being piloted in healthcare as well as um, higher education settings at the moment. And we see a little bit of a difference when we look at um, higher education and workplaces compared to those traditional sectors. So less of you know, the um, predictive or the mnemonics or even the evidence-based risk factors. When we look to the non-traditional sectors, what we're seeing is a lot of just simply identification of obvious warning signs and then referral on to appropriate services, which would again, meet those kind of legal obligations that we saw in Nguyen versus MIT. So the question persuade refer method or safe talk by uh, Living Works are methods that teach frontline workers like either staff or faculty or people that are um, interfacing with say students or employees what the obvious warning signs are for self-directed violence risk and then helping them to figure out how to discuss this with the person in a way that they can engage them and then connect them with the appropriate service so it's more of a an intervention um, so you're identifying the risk but then you're intervening to help put the person in contact with the right individuals so less about um, coming up with a good management plan, more about connecting them with the people that will then take over the case. Great. What we see in the literature um, is a little bit different than what we're seeing in practice. So in practice, we have these kind of functional, at least screening or triage tools that people are using. Uh, but in the literature, we see this move towards more predictive models. Um, so this is as recent as 2017, uh, Walsh and colleagues did a study where they were looking at patient health records, so electronic health data, and they were trying to look at risk factors that predicted a non-fatal suicide attempt 270 days out from the attempt, all the way up to seven days um, just before the attempt. So they could get a sense of what were the more proximal risk factors or the distal risk factors. And I think this is a very um, interesting study in the sense that it'd be good for us to figure out which risk factors might be more associated with imminent risk for self-directed violence versus chronic or distal risk. Um, but when we think about using things like this in practice, we run into a lot of problems. Uh, so, you know, for example, looking at the risk factors that were um, most strongly predictive of risk of non-fatal attempts uh, seven days out, we see things like the number of melatonin receptor agonists or history of self-inflicted poisoning, number of outpatient visits in the past year, their BMI, their age. So that's great that we know that these things were really important in terms of um, imminent risk or more proximal risk of engaging in a non-fatal suicide attempt. But when I think about coming up with a good management plan, now that I know that the person's at risk, I can't exactly wait for them to age out or give them a you know plan to decrease their BMI or even the melatonin receptor agonist is likely um, actually reflecting that the person had problems with sleep and that they were taking some medication for sleep. So 
even though these predictive models can be helpful, they don't imply causation, they don't help us explain the relationships between risk factors and risk, and they also don't help us in terms of coming up with good treatment uh, plans for individuals. So again, thinking about the tools that you're using, you want to make sure that they're working for you, that they're actually helping you meet your professional obligations, but also to plan for how to reduce this outcome from happening, not just to predict it. So moving to from identifying risk to thinking about comprehensive assessment of risk for self-directed violence. So a lot of what people are doing is risk identification, as I said. Um, so using those kind of screening tools or even triage. We see uh, fewer people, and this should be the case, that are actually responsible for doing comprehensive assessments of risk for self-directed violence. Even the people that are actually responsible for doing this, we see all too often in different settings like healthcare or criminal justice settings that people are doing a very cursory kind of, as I said, 10 to 15 minute assessment of risk, um, which likely isn't going to meet our best practice standards in terms of our clinical practice or our legal standards of care around risk for self-directed violence. If you're the person responsible for doing a comprehensive assessment of risk. Um, this has been a Interestingly, the same debates that happened in the field of risk of violence towards other people have happened in the field of self-directed violence. So there are some really interesting parallels uh, in the research literature between what's the best method to use. Um, so we see, same as we saw with violence risk, these two broad approaches um, early on. So back in the say 70s, for example, um, there was a lot of people that were using unstructured clinical judgment. So this is where you're taking the risk factors and you're weighting or combining them in um, you, by using your own judgment and not any fixed or explicit rules. So it's more impressionistic, uh, it's more intuitive. Um, and this, the scholars and the academics kind of reacted to, you know, there's a whole debate about that we don't do this any better than chance. So we need to have structure. And so there was this kind of push to moving more actuarial or predictive methods. And we're still, we're kind of seeing a full circle back to that in the academic literature back to more of those predictive models. Um, but the reaction to the unstructured clinical judgment was to you know, have clear structure on how to weight and combine things. This is a mathematical or statistical approach to risk prediction to get away from those pitfalls of unstructured clinical judgment. But what we've found over time, especially in the area of risk for self-directed violence is that we don't do a great job of predicting even when we use these tools. That's why we're moving to big data and machine learning models and things is because we're not doing a great job of predicting. Um, so the, this kind of battle has waged itself in the literature, but if you look at the history of the field of self-directed violence, people have long been saying that either of these approaches are actually inappropriate on their own that we shouldn't be using only our judgment without any structure, and we shouldn't be using clearly statistical or predictive models, that we're not doing a good enough job in terms of bridging that process from assessment to management if all we're concerned about is prediction. Um, so this has been discussed for years in this field that either of these two approaches on their own are not appropriate. And so we should try and find assessment practices or tools that kind of marry the strengths of each of these approaches being able to use evidence-based risk factors, but also being able to use our clinical judgment. Most best practice standards or guidelines that are written on self-directed violence talk about the importance of clinical judgment. So being able to use your intuition, but also to be able to consider case-specific risk factors that might not have been studied very well. Um, so this has been an ongoing discussion in, in this area. Regardless of what you use in terms of a tool, I would argue that any tool that you use should meet these goals, even if it's an actuarial tool or even if it's structured professional judgment, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, or even if you're using unstructured clinical judgments, it should, you should be able to take this uh, tool and look at this slide and it should meet each of these goals. The first one being prevention. Any tool you use in terms of comprehensive assessment should help you plan well, should help you guide and coordinate your activities so that you prevent the outcome from happening. That should be the focus rather than focusing on prediction. Otherwise, what's the point of our assessment? Uh, secondly, it should also uh, increase your accountability to others. So it should be clear when I'm doing a comprehensive assessment of risk for self-directed violence, why I'm making the recommendations I'm making, why I've reached the decisions that I've reached by the time that you get to the end of the report. There sh it should be no secret, just like we say with violence risk assessments, that it should be clear when you get to the recommendation section why I think that's important. Um, it should be transparent to others. 
but it should also help us improve the consistency of our decisions so that somebody else considering similar information with a similar person and similar context would make very similar um, decisions or very similar recommendations. Um, so it should improve consistency across raters as well. And finally, it should help protect not just us, but the people that we're working with. Uh, when we've consulted on cases of self-directed violence and people are asking about appropriate tools to use, often the concern focuses on liability, uh, limiting exposure to professional liability. And I think that this is a, an important goal as well. Nobody wants to have a client um, kill themselves and nobody wants to be successfully sued. Um, you know, anybody can sue us, but we don't want them to necessarily be successful. Uh, but I would argue that it's also important for us to think about the rights of the people that we're evaluating. If we're so concerned about liability issues, we tend to, you know, act from this place of fear that I don't want to be held liable. So I'm going to take, you know, any measure that I have to in order to keep this person safe. And I'm going to err on the side of um, incapacitation. So putting them in the hospital, for example, uh, rather than thinking about a partial or day program or thinking about having the person managed with increased supports in the community. So you want a tool that helps um, limit your liability, but that also helps limit um, the restrictions that you're putting on the person to the least restrictive alternative principle. Many people that work uh, with suicidal clients will say that this is one of the most stressful aspects of their job is to think about possible litigation. Um, and many professionals will actually um, refuse to see clients that, um, that are at high risk for suicide to say that that's not necessarily within their wheelhouse or their competence, so they don't see those kind of patients. Um, so we even see exclusions from research studies, people that are um, highly or acutely suicidal. So again, I understand that um, you wanted to limit that exposure, but again, th this just means that we have less competent professionals working with people who need the support um, and we should be able to balance with a good process or good tool liability and infringing upon the person's rights. So any good tool should be able to meet these three goals. And I think, and this is what we're going to um, talk about today, is focusing on uh, structured professional judgment, I think is a nice way, as I said, of marrying those um, the advantages of those two approaches, discretionary and non-discretionary. They allow us to meet our professional obligations, and they also meet those three goals of assessment. Um, so SPJ approaches, it, broadly, they rely on judgment to structure the exercise of professional discretion. So the goal of the manuals or the guidelines from the structured professional judgment approach is to provide structure to your planning. It's not to tell you what to think, you know, is this person high, moderate, or low? It's uh, there to assist you in terms of how to think about a case, not what to think about a case. So they guide your attention to evidence-based risk factors, but you're still able to consider, as I said, your professional or clinical opinion on a case. And the whole purpose of them is prevention rather than prediction. These tools reflect best practices in that they specify within them um, basic risk factors that every comprehensive assessment at minimum should be considering uh, based on the literature. So any risk factors that are coming up um, most often in terms of the literature on being associated with risk for self-directed violence, these should all be considered in every assessment, but it doesn't restrict your scope. So you're still able to consider case specific details or risk factors. Um, we get people that will sometimes use SPJ approaches and they'll say, well, you know, I don't know where to put this information and you can put it in another category so long as you're not losing sight of important details around risk. So your scope's not uh, restricted in terms of what you can consider. There's no scoring rules. This is comforting to some people, but um, other people who find comfort in numbers uh, don't like this approach as much. Um, again, it's not going to get you to count up scores to say this person falls in a high, moderate, or low range. And I would argue that, especially when it comes to um, risk for self-directed violence, that that kind of gets us into this area where we're doing somewhat arbitrary assessments, where we're not considering, again, specific aspects of this individual or this case if we're simply adding up numbers of risk factors and then assigning an overall risk level. Um, again, I think we should also move away from assigning risk levels to clients. I think that's important, but we should also be thinking about the numbers of in, or the intensity of interventions that are required in order to reduce the outcome if our goal is truly prevention and not um, prediction. The other thing that's good in terms of SPJ is that um, they often include, they're not as concerned with statistical predictions. So there's a lot of dynamic risk factors that are included that are uh, very good at picking up on change or fluctuations in risk. And this should be very important if you're trying to determine, you know, is my, um, are my strategies in terms of risk mitigation effective? Am I actually um, reducing 
uh, risk of harm towards other people by implementing this assessment and management procedure. You need something that's going to be able to pick up on change. Usually the strongest predictors are the static and unchangeable ones, So, um, but we can't do a lot in terms of treatment for those. If we're not as concerned about prediction, we can include more dynamic risk factors. Uh, the focus in SPJ tools is to structure your planning, as I said, and so how does it do this? Well, it directly guides your actions. It focuses on what should be done based on what you're worried about happening in the future. Um, so we're going to talk about scenario planning briefly in just a moment, but it, it gets you to structure your thinking in terms of moving away from consideration of risk factors to what you think the person might do. And then on the basis of your worries about what they might do, focusing on what needs to be done to prevent that. It's also based on prudence, which comes from the Latin word prudential, uh, which means foresight or sagacity. It's where you're combining uh, your knowledge of the literature along with your technical training or skills or experience to make well-reasoned decisions about the future. So it's that combination of what you know in terms of the literature and then your practice or experience uh, to help you think um, in a reasoned way about the future. And I think this is probably the biggest strength of the SPJ approach is that it relies on qualitative or narrative reasoning. The focus is on formulation rather than statistical formulas. Formulation or case conceptualization is a core competency for mental health professionals like physicians or psychologists or clinicians, for example. Um, so this is something that's required as a part of our training and we should be applying this to our risk assessments. And the nice thing that um, SPJ approaches or procedures do is provide some structure on how to engage in formulation. Uh, some of the advantages of the SPJ approach is that it doesn't require prediction. As I said, you're focused on what you think might happen, not trying to predict what will happen. And my last, uh, I'm you know, harboring on this point about prediction, but I honestly think that um, we should be wrong in our predictions anyway. I mean, if I think that a client's going to kill themselves, I should be taking steps to prevent that from happening and ultimately wrong in my prediction anyway. So I'm not sure why if I'm working really hard to make my predictions wrong, I'd be so concerned with predicting the future. Um, we know we don't do a good job at that, so we should really be shifting and changing our focus to prevention. Uh, these approaches don't require certainty. Some statistical tools require you to answer a certain number of questions or have a certain number of amount of information in order to proceed. Whereas if you're using an SPJ approach, it helps you evaluate actions that you can take in light of the, the information that's available to you at the time. Um, if you have limited information and the information that's missing is consequential, so it, it impedes your ability to engage in case conceptualization, to think about scenarios for the future, or to come up with a good management plan, then of course you probably shouldn't be doing the assessment. You can say you don't have enough information, but it doesn't um, tell you when that's the case. It just allows you to provide some, some structure on uh, making uh, recommendations for treatment, even if you don't have all the information that you'd like uh, at the time. It also encourages causal or systemic thinking. And I think this again is one of the um, big strengths in that it uh, helps you think about some of the risk factors that are driving the bus, so to speak, in terms of the risk for self-directed violence. So you're not just considering, you know, 17 out of 20 risk factors are all present. It actually encourages you to take the next step and to think about, well, which ones are the most important in terms of either risk or uh, complicating risk management. And this can be really helpful when you're trying to come up with a treatment plan that uh, uses resources efficiently. You can think about which risk factors need to be addressed right away versus which ones can wait and which ones are going to give you the most bang for your buck, so to speak, in terms of reducing um, risk. Then you can start with those. So it actually gets you to think a little bit more about those controlling or those really important risk factors, not just the presence, but the relevance of them. Um, so you do this through the, the formulation. And this is kind of a nice thing, as I said, even though in, in, uh, it's a core competency for us to engage in case conceptualization across uh, mental health professionals or health professionals, SPJ approaches actually provide some structure on how to do this. You can use any approach to formulation when you're using an SPJ tool, but it provides some guidance on how to think about the risk factors. So to ask yourself if the risk factor is present, is this something that's increasing the perceived benefits of self-directed violence? Is it reducing the costs? Or is it disrupting the person's ability to think about self-directed violence? And I think this structure around formulation actually maps nicely onto some of the major treatments for self-directed violence, like dialectical behavior therapy, where they view uh, suicide as a way of solving a problem. So to reduce the stigma around a client's suicide, you think about it as the clients focusing on suicide as being a potential solution to their problems that they're having. 
Um, so this allows you to think about how did the person come to make this decision to engage in self-directed violence? How did they come to make this choice to be a way of solving their problems? And so you ask yourself with the risk factors, you know, is this something, how is it impacting this individual's choices? Is it motivating, disinhibiting, or destabilizing their decisions? Um, by thinking about formulation, this is where you get away from just a list of risk factors to thinking about this person in this context, this case with this risk. So it helps you individualize it. Um, and just to lastly, as we wrap up here, um, the other uh, strength about, uh, I think, the SPJ approach and why it fits well for suicide um, risk assessment and management or risk for self-directed violence is that it gets you to think about the future uh, in a structured way, to think about what do you think, um, what possible futures do you think are, are possible for this individual? So when you're working in conditions of complexity or unbounded uncertainty, which is certainly the case for self-directed violence, um, scenario planning can be useful. It helps you avoid tunnel vision where you're thinking about just one outcome, for example, to thinking about multiple possible futures that the person could engage in. So provide some structure in terms of how to think about the scenarios. Is the person going to do just what they most recently did or what they've ever done in a repeat scenario? Are they going to engage in a different behavior with a different motivation or a change in the context in a twist scenario? Are they, could they escalate? Is a lethal or worst case scenario on the table or can I rule that out? And then the improvement scenario, the best case scenario. If you're not actually thinking about a desistance scenario, it's really hard to get the person to move in that direction. Um, so thinking about possible futures like this helps us avoid that tendency to just think about the lethal scenarios. Many people do this with suicide where they think, oh my gosh, the person could kill themselves again rather than engage in non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so you want to think about the repeater twist because this directly maps onto the management that you're going to be doing. So based on what you think is possible in these scenarios, you're going to be thinking of different management strategies for the repeat, the twist, the escalation, for example. And you're going to want to include things like monitoring, who's going to be responsible for ongoing or repeated assessments or tracking like we talked about earlier, um, what types of treatments, informal or formal, are you going to recommend? Should there be any restrictions of freedoms? And then with any good uh, plan for um, suicide or self-directed violence management, you should have a good safety plan. What is the person going to do when there's um, no incidents of concern, when things are routine? What are they going to do in non-emergency situations? And then what are they going to do in emergencies? So you should always have a good um, safety plan in place. But your scenarios are going to help you think about what types of tactics am I going to recommend under each of these broad strategies. So putting this all together in terms of a comprehensive approach to self-directed violence, risk assessment and management, we should have uh, starting with a triage or a screening procedure that helps us identify, do I have a reason to be concerned? This should always be a first step for you because if you're recommending comprehensive assessment next, you wanna make sure that you have good reason to do so. Once you get to the assessment stage, you're collecting and sharing information about a person. So you wanna make sure, do I even have a reason to be concerned about self-directed violence in this case? So starting with the triage or screening and then moving to assessment and then finally to management. And this is a, um, I know they look like a linear process here in terms of the graphic, but think about this as iterative. Once you're, you know, you implement your management strategies, you're going to get information about how the person's doing that might feed back into further assessment. Um, so this kind of keeps going back and forth until you've hopefully prevented the outcome from happening. I'm just going to end with um, some existing guidelines for SPJ that are out there right now. There's actually a few, um, just to have this last minute here. The Suicide Incessant Manual for Inmates is to be used in jail settings within the first 24 hours of entry into a jail. This was developed by um, Patty Zapf, I think in 2006 or so. So this can be really helpful for those closed settings like jails. Bush and Marshall developed the SRAM or the Suicide Risk Assessment and Management Manual in 2005. Um, this was designed to be just like the HCR 20 for those of you who are familiar with SPJ for violence towards others. Uh, Caroline Logan developed the Suicide Behavior Risk Evaluation. Um, this is again includes non-suicidal and suicidal behavior just like the guidelines for preventing self-directed violence or the SDV um, that myself and colleagues are uh, developing. So, there are a few different options that are out there. If anybody's interested in resources or anything on these, I'm happy to um, pass them along or share them with individuals. Um, I think the nice thing, as I said, with this approach, I think it maps nicely onto our professional responsibilities and obligations around self-directed violence. And so I just want to leave you with food for thoughts uh, in terms of your sector. Uh, just to ask yourself, what are my professional responsibilities or legal responsibilities in the sector I work in? 
Does my strategy for identifying risk actually facilitate prevention or my ability to um, intervene or mitigate risk? Does my strategy for comprehensively assessing risk bridge or map onto my management plans? And then are my tools transparent, consistent, and do they help both me and the evaluee? So just ask yourself this when you are deciding on what tool to use in your particular setting is, does it help you um, answer each of these questions and help you be more transparent, consistent, and accountable? All right, thank you very much. I, I know I'm right at the 12 o'clock here, um, so I'm just gonna open it up for questions. I'm happy to stay, as we said at the beginning, for people that do have uh, questions. All right, All right. thank you thank so much for doing that. Sorry, I suddenly heard myself. There's no echo, right? We're good? We're good. Okay. It's really disorienting for me. Okay, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I, we have some questions. I'm gonna go ahead and read those off. Um, so the first question says, um, assessment and management of self-directed violence in those with personality disorders would apply to this individual's research, looking at 22 suicides of um, famous psychoanalysts. He then goes on to say, however, when I approached analytic institutes requesting data on methodology of and reasons behind the suicides from their archives, they were not communicative. Um, opprobrium often surrounds the family and or professional suicide victims, making it verboten. In your experience, does this ever obfuscate the purveyance of clinical data? And if so, what can one do to rectify it? Good question. I think what if I'm and feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm missing something here, Simone, but I think in terms of the question, it sounds like um, what the person's asking is when you're asking um, either an organization for information about a past suicide or you're asking a family for information about an individual trying to get at the possible motives. Um, for engaging in self-directed violence that people are, are um, less uh, likely to respond or like not very communicative about those um, uh, those questions. And I think that does happen. And we actually see this happen, um, interestingly, quite a bit in Canada compared to the US when we look at data that we collect on self-directed violence, we don't collect as much data. And we actually have some organizations that will code um, incidents. So like deaths, for example, a different way. So it doesn't, it's not coded or collected or recorded as being a suicide. And so this really gets in the way of us being able to um, assess and do research on this area in Canada. In the US, there's a little bit better data collection in workplaces around suicides than we have here. Um, and usually the part of the reason why this happens is that the family actually says, I don't want people to know that this was a suicide. And so that changes the recording process. So this can happen and it is going to, you know, limit your um, assessment in some ways. The, approach that I take when I'm working with families is to involve them in the process from the very beginning. So as to, um, you know, of course, following ethics, informed consent, talking to the individual to see if they're, if, if it's a non-fatal attempt to have somebody um, in the family involved so that you can get information from them as well. Um, if it's a fatal attempt, then you're just working with the family. It's trying to get information from them by explaining to them exactly what your process is. Sometimes people are more worried about the opinions that you're going to come to or the decisions you're going to make and not wanting to share information about that. So just being as transparent as possible about why you're collecting the information that you're collecting, why it's important. Um, and again, of course, if you're limited in being able to answer the questions, there's not uh, much that you can do if somebody's not giving up the, the data. But sometimes if we can't get it, their specific reasons, we can look at things like antecedents and consequences and then try and infer motivations from that as well. But that is a little bit um, um, trickier. I'm not sure if I entirely answered that question there, but let me know either Simone or Rachel if I've missed anything. No, that was let perfect. me just interrupt real quick oh. because it, it seems like everybody hit the CEU link and so the website is crashing again like last week. <laughs> so my recommendation for everyone is to just don't panic, save the link somewhere. You have 48 hours to fill it out. If there are any issues, we will get you what you need. So. Uh, you know, just like 700 people going for the website right now is just um, overloading it a little bit. So just save the link and try it again later. Thank you, Rachel. Um, okay, so the next question we have is, can you discuss the relationship of violence and self-directed and self -directed violence? Um, can you direct me by to references by chance? So I think maybe 
you already have some references listed, Brie, or, or are there some additional ones that maybe you could send when you send the slides or something? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, in terms of research, there's a few people, uh, Hillbrand or Hildebrand, I think has done some research in this area looking at intersecting risks. Um, I looked at this in my master's. They, I think that what you're not gonna find if this is what you're looking for is good guidance on how to do an assessment where you're considering multiple risks. Um, so that actually is just a problem in terms of our, our literature right now is that there's very little, for the people that develop different types of tools, very little guidance on how you actually um, put them together. Uh, if you're using an SPJ approach, the good news is that you can combine um, risk factors from other tools. So it's not going to be as much of an issue as if you're using actuarial tools, for example, and trying to combine different sources of data there. Um, if you're using the same style or type of approach, it can be a little bit um, easier. But there's a, a huge overlap between um, suicide, like self-directed violence and other directed violence. And you'll see in the tools as well that you, some of the risk factors are actually quite overlapping, but you're going to see some differences between them too. Um, so in the guidelines for preventing self-directed violence, it's actually a few that are specific just to suicide or self-directed violence and, and some that are significantly overlapping with risk of harm towards others. Um, and this is really just true for risk of any type of violence. You see a good core set of risk factors that overlap between all of them. So just make sure that your tool allows you to um, capture all of those important overlapping risk factors, but not lose sight of the unique ones. And then in terms of research, I'm happy to send a couple articles out as well, but it's, it's smaller in terms of the literature base than it should be, I guess I am saying. Okay, um, so the next question we have says, I'm trying to understand the clinical implications here. If I do a risk assessment and it's high, I should be taking steps, but often the steps cause more trouble and alienate the client from future treatment. For example, here in Florida, a Baker, a Baker Act will put the person in care for three days. Most people are released. Um, they are then fearful of seeking help because they have been, you know, Baker acted on and don't want to risk it again. I know this is an impossible question, but how do you generally balance it? And then the same person also has a follow-up question of saying, you know, have people been sued for violating confidentiality when they make a report? I'm aware of similar situations where that's occurred. So it's sort of like a two-part question from the same person. Okay, uh, great question. We have the same frustrations for anybody that's joining us in British Columbia. We have, if you work in this area that we have very similar frustrations. Um, there's not a great intermediary program for people that are acutely at risk for suicide. Some areas will have partial hospitalization programs where the person can go in for say eight hours during the day to this day program. They can be there, they can go home when their support's available at home. So they're basically not unattended um, during the day and they're getting treatment um, throughout a significant period. So it's a high intensity, but it's not putting the person in hospital, for example. Um, next to that, we really don't have much here in British Columbia either. We have outpatient programs. Um, the interesting thing is when you look at programs or treatments for self-directed violence, so dialectical behavior therapy probably has the most, um, the most empirical support in terms of an intervention for reducing suicide. Uh, they, the clinicians actually work as hard as possible to prevent the, the clients from going into the hospital. So nobody wants that. The client doesn't want it. The clinician doesn't want it. Um, and for exactly the same reasons that you're discussing, it can erode trust. Um, they might not be wanting to discuss, you know, suicide in the future because they're worried about going into a hospital. And so, again, in, in those situations, it's, um, in my experience, it's been kind of working with the client to say, listen, I don't want you in the hospital either because it's going to impact your treatment. We're not going to be able to, you know, engage in ongoing treatment if you're in the hospital, especially when it's like a three day hold, they're not usually getting a ton of, you know, long term interventions, it's just to prevent them from doing anything to harm themselves for that period of time. So it's like a pause on their skill development. Um, but sometimes hospitalization is required in order to keep a person safe. And so it's, it's important to just build that trust with your clients so that you have a good sense of when it's an emergency, and when you can put other, um, you know, procedures in place for mitigating or managing their risk. It might be implementing other community supports or people that they have, if, if they have that available to them, to help keep them out of the hospital when they're in those elevated but not acute uh, stages in terms of risk for self-directed violence. So there's a lot of, I know it's a, a challenging question to answer, but I think that, as I said, even the good um, treatment programs will try and keep individuals out of the hospital. 
Sometimes it's going to be necessary, but you really want to make sure that the assessment that you're doing and the tool that you're doing helps you try and um, think through that where you're not just responding to fear about the person doing it, but you're truly responding to the risks that are that are present and trying to keep in mind that least restrictive alternative. Um, yes, clinicians have been sued in the past for uh, disclosing when they shouldn't have disclosed, so reporting. Um, we get this question a lot, actually, when we're consulting with uh, some of those non-traditional sectors, where they'll say, you know, should I be letting the family know about this person's risk? And again, the answer to that is that it depends. If the family can actually intervene and prevent that person from harming themselves in the moment, like say the client runs out of your office and they're going home and they've said that they're going to kill themselves and they're going home to do it, and there's a parent home, for example, or a sister or brother, like a, an adult sister or brother, that you may be able to, you know, not just call police, but also call them as well to say, you know, this is what's happening. Can you make sure that the person's safe when they when they're there? But calling a family member that's 3000 miles away and letting them know what's going on if they can't directly intervene is not consistent with what we saw in that um, ethics code at the beginning in terms of what we should be doing for um, notification. So really asking yourself that question is the person that I'm telling, can they do anything to intervene to reduce the risk? Um, would be an important question. And then also, am I disclosing just what's necessary in order to prevent harm from happening? So it's that, again, like disclosing as little as possible, but um, people have disclosed in what the courts have decided were either to people who couldn't intervene or in non-emergency situations. And then sometimes you'll see people getting um, sanctions, for example, or um, suspensions on licenses or um, being put under supervision through the college, for example. Okay, lots of great job. This is awesome. Just so you know, I've already, I'd like dismissed them, but lots of thank really, <laughs> thank you. This is wonderful. Um, some folks are asking for some references. So SPJ guidelines references, please. Um, somebody else is also asking if the measures mentioned for both triage and SPJ assessment, um, if there are any of those that are available for free, uh, if you know of any like that. Um, and maybe if you don't, off the top of your head, if you want to send us we can send those out to all the participants, like references and lists of stuff like that. Um, the next question says, how might this approach ideally look within workplace settings? Are psychologists on staff for evaluations and monitoring or are employees referred out for evaluations and interventions? How do employers have the authority to do this work in an employment context? Great question. I like this. So um, in, in terms of the authority part of it, the really interesting thing is when you look at higher education or workplaces, um, where it gets very tricky is if it looks like the risk is connected to some sort of mental health problem, for example, um, then it kicks in this, um, you know, duty to accommodate. So the workplace or the higher education institution has to take steps to accommodate the same mental health problem or the disability, um, even if it's connected to risk, for example. Um, so that's always going to be a consideration is that what what is kind of driving the risk is there a nexus between a mental health problem and the person's risk the other um, important uh, point is that workplaces they have a responsibility not just to the person to you know provide support and resources and to keep them safe but to the other employees as well so that's where i think workplaces find themselves vulnerable is if they have someone you know we talked about the stats at the beginning 1.5 you know per 1 million cases this happens in the workplace. And if somebody is engaging in self-directed violence in such a way that it's causing psychological harm to other people in the workplace, again, the employer is gonna have a responsibility to keep the other people safe as well. So it becomes quite complicated. The organizations that we've worked with have used either kind of a screening or a triage procedure to identify those warning signs. And then they'll have, for example, like a threat assessment team or a behavioral intervention team that works within the organization, specifically if they're a large one, um, if not, sometimes they consult out to other people. If they're worried about this, they might consult experts to say, can you do this evaluation? And then they come in and do an evaluation of the person's risk for self-directed violence. If you think that the employee is posing a risk of harm to other people by engaging in this behavior, and again, sometimes you have to think about the method that they're going to use. Is the method something that could put other people at risk or even engaging in it at the office puts other people at risk for psychological harm? is you're gonna to have to think about, can the person actually be at the workplace or does the risk, um, is it, it poses too high? So you might have an assessment that's being done while the person's on like compassionate leave or leave with pay while they undergo this evaluation, just so that you can get a good management plan in place. 
um, before they come back to the institution. So there's a number of things that employ employers can do, but the really uh, tough part that they find themselves in is balancing these um, legal responsibilities. So the responsibilities to the other people that the person's working with, the responsibilities to the individual, and then also thinking about um, kind of that nexus. Is there any duty to accommodate issues here um, or conduct related issues that we should also be talking about? So it becomes a, a complicated legal landscape, um, but it is something that employers can do. And many of them start with that triage process where people are educated on what the warning signs are or screening and then referring to a team or people that are responsible for doing either a little bit more of a comprehensive assessment or referring out to experts or consultants to do the evaluation. Great. Um, so a couple of folks are sort of asking about uh, maybe suggestions on how to you know, if they're interested in the measures of the SPJ tools that you just reviewed, um, including the one that you're developing with colleagues, they're asking what the best way to do that, you know, to access or review them. Um, similar question here saying, you mentioned resources, assessment tools, how can we get access to those? Um, do you have any just general suggestions for folks or? Yeah. I would say copy my email address down there um, and then shoot me an email. One thing that I, I can't do for uh, copyright reasons is just do a mass uh, send out of even some of the like articles, for example. But if people contact me specifically, I'm able to share an article with someone specifically or share a resource with them specifically. So um, I'm probably, I don't know if I'm going to end up getting a lot of emails around this, but that would probably be the, <laughs> the best you way. In terms you're you're going to regret that. <laughs> <laughs> probably the best way in terms of copyright restrictions, just around uh, articles and, and things like that as well. So some of them um, are available like freely, like I said, the tools that we're developing are in the pilot stage. So they're, they're not for sale for purchase or anything, but we do provide them out. There are workplaces, higher education, healthcare that is, are using them. So just contact me directly <laughs> for that. Luckily for you, it's only 250 people left on here. So okay. not the full 500 or 600 people. <laughs> um, so someone else is asking in the definition of self-directed violence, who does the reasonable fear refer to? In other words, to who is the reasonable fear caused? The person, others, right? Like, do they have reasonable fear or maybe loved ones of that person have reasonable fear? So who does it apply to? Great question um, in terms of it's an oversight in the definition when I was going over it, but the reasonable fear aspect is important because sometimes you have a client that um, might, or someone that you're evaluating like a patient or anyone that um, isn't necessarily communicating direct intent or clear intent to engage in self-directed violence. But, and I don't like to use this word, I know some people use it, but people will call them like gestures or gestures around self-directed violence. So the person could be leaving ambiguous notes or making statements, you know, like I may not be around longer. So they could be kind of vague or ambiguous statements that give you reason to be concerned about it. And the reason why the reasonable fear is important to um, keep in mind is the fears for other people that might be responsible for evaluating is that if I have a client that I'm working with or an assessment that I'm doing and the person's making these kind of vague statements, but you know, isn't um, explicitly answering yes to questions like, are you thinking about hurting or harming yourself? But they're making all these other statements. You want that still to trigger a response from you. So you want to still say, well, you know, even though that this isn't exactly clear, I, I should be responding in some way to provide resources or, or something for them. So it's kind of like saying, I, I'm thinking this meets the definition of self-directed violence because I have reasonable fear to believe that the person is actually considering doing this, even though they may not want to talk to me about this. Um, so this can be important in things like, uh, you know, healthcare settings or in correctional settings. If someone looks like they, um, you know, are engaging in this kind of gestures or ambiguous or vague statements that if it causes you reasonable fear that they could harm themselves, this should initiate some of your suicide prevention protocols so that you start to do something to intervene, that we're not ignoring those um, signs, even if it's not a clear statement or behavior. So that's why I think the reasonable fear part is important in that definition. Great question. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much all the questions we have. Folks are just asking for reference lists. Um, someone else, uh, she's a local evaluator here, is telling you that's the best risk assessment explanation I have ever heard, even condensed. So I thought I would share that. So thank you so much, Bree. We really appreciate it. It was awesome.
Um, we appreciate your time and when we'll look out for those reference letters, reference lists and things like that and send those to the attendees today. Perfect, thank you so much. And if there's anything I'm missing, Simone too, just uh, like you let me know in an email or anything. And as I said, people yeah. feel free to reach out to me specifically if there's questions that you have or things that I can send you kind of on a one by one basis. Sounds good, yeah. And, and we will be sending out the slides and also the recording for today sometime in the next week. So uh, give us a little bit of time before bombarding us with emails also. <laughs> So right. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bree. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Simone. Thanks, Cara. Bye. Um, thanks. And if anybody needs anything in terms of the CEU link, you can just email us and we'll get that to you. So have a great day. We'll see you next week. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Bye.